Boa mites, a scary pest of honeybees, have been around for 30 years or so and we're still struggling to find solutions against them. Some scholars believe that the best way to bring balance back to beekeeping is to completely stop treatments for Varroa mite and let evolution by natural selection take its course to raise a new genetic stock resistant to this powerful enemy of the honeybees, something called survival stocks. If you're new here, I'm Dr. Umberto Bon Cristiani and this is Inside the Hive.tv, the show that takes you into the world of bees. If you like bees and want to know more about them, please consider to subscribe and also hit the bell button so you don't miss a single video. The subject is controversial and many beekeepers, especially the ones that depend on honeybees to put food on their table, are passionately against this idea. Well, I don't blame them. It is a scary scenario to think about. Even with all the efforts beekeepers are constantly doing right now to keep bees alive, they are still facing high losses every year. If they follow this practice, for sure many of these operations would disappear very fast. And a cascade of damage would start. For example, our food security would be compromised with a shortage of assistant pollination in many different crops out there. Breeding is an interesting alternative to accelerate the process to select better genetic stocks, able to resist varroa mite infestations and therefore perhaps reach the same goals of survival stocks without losing so many bees and beekeepers. Queen breeders can select particular features in honeybees using special techniques and complex operations. There are plenty of programs out there trying hard to find the perfect honeybee which is under the eye of a beekeeper, a honeybee resistant to something considered bad, keeping something that is considered good, which is always something relative. The problem is that the selected honeybee genetic stock doesn't last long. Beekeeping is not like other livestock. We humans are successful breeding cows, for example, because we are able to control their nutrition and genetics completely, and that's not the case of honeybees. Honeybees are considered a semi-domesticated animal exactly because of the lack of food control about their nutrition and reproduction. Therefore, as soon as these special bees are sold to other beekeepers, it is quite difficult to keep the desired genetic stock from mixing with local honeybees, diluting the beneficial features or even losing them at all. So why am I talking about survival stock? If you're following this video series, you know that we are trying to identify, looking at scientific data, what is causing the most damage to the honeybees. The parasitic mite varroa destructor sucking hemolymph and eating the fat bodies of bees, or the viruses that varroa might transmit, or the combination of both. In video number one, we saw what happened to a honeybee population when varroa arrived for the first time. Apparently, Varroa helps change the viral population already established in honeybees, allowing a new, more powerful strain of deformed wing virus to arise. In video number 2, we saw that Varroa apparently established an intriguing symbiotic relationship with deformed wing virus. More mites mean more viruses, and more viruses mean more mites. In this video, we'll look at a very unique honeybee population that can help us understand a little more about this intriguing relationship between varroa mite and viruses. Surprisingly, this new information was only possible because of observations made on a true survival stock. This episode of InsideTheHive.tv was made possible by our fans on Patreon. If you want to get early access to videos like this and help to shape the content of this channel, Please consider supporting us on Patreon by visiting patreon.com slash inside the hive TV. Thank you. The near worldwide distribution of varroa destructor and deformer wing virus has left few opportunities to look at their individual impacts. Papua New Guinea, a large Pacific island to the north of Australia, is home of a unique apes mellifera population that does not have varroa destructor just yet but had experienced the simultaneous introduction of two dangerous mite species, Varroa jacobsoni and Tropileleps mercedesi. The arrival of these two mites devastated the honeybees in the island at the beginning. However, after 8 to 10 years from the introduction, the honeybee population developed some sort of resistance to high mite infestations, 
suggesting that there is some unknown mechanism that allows the Papua New Guinea honeybee population to tolerate these mite infestations. What is causing the honeybee population of Papua New Guinea to tolerate these mites? A recent scientific publication led by Dr. John Roberts, published in the journal of Viruses, investigated if the mechanism behind this tolerance was related to the viruses they carry compared with other bees in other parts of the world. Using molecular techniques and high-throughput screening of viruses, the researchers were able to find well-known viruses such as sac brood virus, black queen cell virus, and lake Sinai viruses. However, the most surprising result was mind-blowing and perhaps will make us reevaluate who is the bad guy in beekeeping today. The researchers found no evidence of the formal wind virus. Please take some time to read the publication. It is open access and you can find a link to the article in the description of this video. The formal wind virus infection is very damaging to the honeybees. Its most recognizable symptom is the malformation of the wings making the honeybee incapable of flying and therefore almost useless to the colony. Other symptoms include shortened lifespan, muscle weakness and more. It is very rare to find a honeybee colony without the formal wing virus today. The absence of the formal wing virus in this honeybee population is fascinating to me because it suggests that varroa mite alone might not be hurting honeybees as much as we think. Instead, the former wing virus might be the one to blame. But the big question is why? Is it the case that the former wing virus has never been in the island before? Or these bees have something special to fight the former wing virus infection? If the latter is true, can we learn from it and perhaps propagate the Papua New Guinea honeybee superpower to other parts of the world? I think discoveries like that are encouraging and bring us some hope. But what I think is even more fascinating is that the data, the information was only possible because of a survival stock and the constant curiosity of humans to observe the world around them. Honeybees are resilient and, as you could see, if we leave them alone, they change and adapt to their new environment if we give them enough time. The problem is that the change good for the bees are not always beneficial economically to the beekeeper. I think that the main question would be, will these new adapted bees fulfill the desires of a species that refuse to understand how life works and will keep trying so hard to push bees to keep doing things they are not adapted to? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this content and share with friends and family to help me spread this message. Click the thumbnail at the screen right now to watch more videos about bees and the logo to subscribe if you didn't already. Thanks for watching. Inside the Hive.tv, the show about bees. See you guys next week.